Welcome to the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I, uh, which of course is powered by the PMA. Let's not get ahead of myself here. I am your host, Dean Phillips. And of course, from our fantastic supporter from Tower Metalworking Fluids, I want to thank so much our guest for today, Scott Prince, who is, of course, the president and CEO. Please welcome Scott. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Now, of course, I always ask a tough question right away. What is your big takeaway? I think my big takeaway uh, is really surrounding AI. And, and certainly I'm not an expert at that, but I, I believe AI will uh, make a larger impact in manufacturing over the next five years. I mean, it's moving fast. Uh, we're seeing a lot of talk recently, even through PMA, as you mentioned. Uh, there's some webinars and some uh, things coming up that are going to address AI. But I, I believe that it's, you know, it's expanding that role of data. And uh, we've been collecting a lot of data for a lot of years. And, uh, and it's just going to open up, I think, so many opportunities uh, that we're going to see that we, we don't even know is going to happen yet. Right. Oh. I'd like to ask you to kind of expand on that. What, when you say that AI and big data are going to have a big impact, personally, how does that personally sit with you? How how do you see things being impactful for you and your customers and uh, manufacturers as a whole? Yeah, I, 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 it's a good question, and I and I think that's uh, that's not difficult to answer, but I think it's how do you apply it, right? And I think that, um, you know, we all can look at that and think, yeah, it's going to, you know, more efficient, more cost effective and, and safe production process. Uh, preventative maintenance going to reduce costs. So there's there's a lot of impacts that it's going to have. And, and we're looking at that today in our business. You know, how, where can we apply that? And, and where's where's the best areas to start? Mm -hmm. And I know when I when I look at AI, it it certainly promises an awful lot. I, I hope it can deliver on one tenth of what what we hear people talk about. Because if it can even deliver that small amount, I I really believe it's going to change everything. You're you're a hundred percent correct. When I, I I think that you know. A lot of it surrounds, you know, the the you know optimizing the process, and I think you hear a lot of that. You know, we talk about robots, and we talk about a lot of different things, um, but I think it can take it, you know, in a lot of different directions. You know, for us, we're even looking at, you know, how how can that affect customer service? How can that affect sales? Uh, in addition to our process, so there's just a lot of areas that I think are. Not unknowns. I think we know what they are, and I think that every company's really got to got to look at you know where are they going to benefit, and, and you know where where should they really focus on when they start to understand you know what AI can really do. Right. It's it's interesting. Uh, one of the companies that I've worked with uh, over the years has been uh, Nissan, and they use a product there that analyzes vibration current draw, uh, tonnage, all of those types of things. When And what they do is, is it analyzes it to be more predictive. Sure. And I think that's that's one of the, the promises of AI that I look so forward to is that trend analysis and understand as best we can where we're going and to be able to make better decisions so that we're not making knee-jerk reactions, which are very costly. If you're reactive in technology, in the maintenance departments, and in production, it comes back to bite you because now everything costs just escalate. Sure. And I, I really feel that that's one of those areas where AI can really deliver. Do you see... AI being able to do more things for your business and delivering to to customers out there. Sure, and uh, you know you mentioned predictive maintenance, and I think that uh, you know for a machine, you know people have a lot of presses or things like that. I mean, 
you know, you're you're hearing now how how that predictive maintenance can come in forms of well, I can predict, you know, it can predict the energy from a press from shift to shift, how much energy that's going to use, you know, based on your production needs and schedules and things like that. So, I mean, it's really, uh, you know, I think that from from that perspective and predicting uh, where things might be going can have a, a, a drastic effect on on our business for sure. Sure. Let's let's look at how we apply some of these these technologies. Uh, I know that you uh, had provided me with a, a picture here, and one of the things that it struck me right away is how quickly today vision systems have evolved, because they they were fairly. Uh, archaic in some of the, when they first started being applied, you had to have a lot more controlled lighting. You had to have, uh, you had to really slow down your process to really work, but that's, that doesn't seem to be the case. Or, or is that what you're seeing now? Yeah, it, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's evolved tremendously. I mean, I go back to the days when uh, we were manufacturing uh, parts for the airbags and you know, we applied a lot of different fasteners uh, to the parts and um, and you'd have a, you know, an M6 nut or a standoff or something. And back in those days, you know, zero defects and zero PPM was a was a big thing. Right. And and back in the 90s, you know, if you had a reject, you called temps in, you, you sorted, you know, all your parts and sort them at the at the customer. And then, you know, we started getting into technology and adding proximity sensors. And then you went into some vision systems on conveyors, and then we went into in-die uh, insertion or tapping or welding and inspection. Uh, so the vision system comes a long way. And today, you know, you can you can measure 450 different attributes on a particular item in seconds. You know, so it has evolved significantly from the days that uh you know back when when i was involved in some of this mistake uh it's come a long way so yeah it's uh it's definitely evolving and it's it's continuing to evolve and it will over the next few years right tell so give us a little bit of your background how did you get involved with uh manufacturing and uh the stamping industry well uh i'm glad you asked that so i got into it back in uh, 1990 actually uh, I was uh, a friend of mine, had been the president of a, a metal stamping company, was looking for a production control uh, person, and uh, I was in between jobs, and uh, he came across and talked, and uh, and that was it. I didn't know what a press was. I didn't know what a die maker was, and so a lot of things and a lot of training along the way. Uh, certainly, you know, we talked about PMA and associations involvement, but. Uh, We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but it was, I didn't know anything about this industry and it was fascinating once I got in and uh, learned and, and understood and went into engineering, spent some time in quality, uh, just kind of worked my way up into the organization that I was in and, and uh, you know, it, it, here I am today, you know, it's a little different. I was 27 years in, in manufacturing from a metal stamping fabrication and, and machining standpoint. And today now I'm in the lubrication business. So it's a little bit different, but I think all the issues and the things we talk about as it relates to manufacturing, as it relates to, you know, AI and the things that are coming along in the future, uh, it's, it's, we re it's really common uh, uh, approach to the business and how we're doing things. Yeah. If, if you were to look at some of the things that, uh, the new technologies, things like uh, robotics, things like vision systems, things like augmented reality and, and virtual reality. What other technologies do you see being really the next cutting edge thing that, that we need to look at as we start to progress here as, as technology starts to play an incredibly important role, especially in things like workforce development, uh, mm -hmm. And some of the other challenges that we're faced with in manufacturing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that um, this is cutting edge, but I think 
you know, we talk about uh, the equipment and the vision systems and things like that. And, you know, we're starting to look at the other side of it and talking about, you know, the communication end of it. You know, how are, how are we interacting with our customers? How are we making it easier for our customers uh, to get product recommendation and technical, you know, advice from, from us uh, real time and not maybe having to wait for a salesman or a technical person to call them back. So I think as we're, we're looking at the big picture, it's, it's really looking at all avenues of your business. And obviously the customer is the most important part of our business. And we're looking at how can we better service them? How can we interact with them, uh, communicate with them on a much different level? And I think AI brings a lot of that to the forefront as it relates to, you know, um, yeah, chat, you know, GPT. I mean, that, there's something out there and, and, you know, people are already into that. But I think that looking at how we can take different ways uh, other than just in the you know in the shop, if you will, and then be able to take that and leverage that with communication and having our servicing our customers a little bit more effectively. Right. It, I, I like the word you use there of, of effectively being more ef uh, effective in what we do. Right. Uh, I, I was at Fabtech here just recently and was speaking on workforce, and one of the challenges that a lot of people that are faced with is being effective, uh, getting the most value out of the people that you have. How do we do that? And I think that's really interesting because if you think of the dollars per person that you have on staff, how do I use them the most effective way that they can so that they can perform their jobs that only they can perform sure. and do it in a most effective way is do you see us moving in more of a direction of that, of being more effective in the way we, we utilize our, our workforce? I do. And, and I think not only effective, but I think given that workforce, some oper more opportunity. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we, we, you know, you mentioned robots and, you know, that's, that's in play with a lot of things and a lot of repetitive type of tasks, right? Well, you know, if you have an employee who is continuing to do those repetitive tasks and you insert AI, for example, with a robot, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, employees are afraid, you know, with AI is going to take their jobs away. And I think the opposite, I think opportunity, because now you can take that person and deploy them to more important tasks. You can train them and give them more opportunity to grow within the organization. So I like to look at it as, you know, this is an opportunity for everybody uh, to be able to do more and become more valuable. So yeah. I walk in every day and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, packing parts off the press or I'm coming in here and I'm, I'm you know, filling drums with, with lubricant. I mean, on a regular basis, there's ways that I think people then can, can take AI and really gain more responsibility and more opportunity for themselves. On the metal working fluid side of things, do you see AI being able to get give us a better and a more informed decision making process when we talk about things like AI, where we can now prove that your let's say one fluid over another one is performing so much better, and, and therefore it makes them uh, the operators, makes the company, the customers, manufacturers more effective. Do you think that that's a, a potential here for AI? I do. I think it's a potential. I mean, we have a, a, we have a lot of equipment, a lot of technology that allows us uh, as we're formulating product to really prove that product out before it leaves the plant. And, uh, and I see that becoming even more advanced as we move forward. Uh, we're constantly looking at that and how can we improve on that? We're we continuously invest in the company and we're buying more equipment. Every every piece of equipment we buy, you know, just has that more, you know, has that uh, additional, um, you know, technology that allows us to do more up front. And as you said earlier, predict the performance of a lubricant uh, that maybe it was, you had to go out and test or trial something first to make sure it worked. And now we can really predict how that's going to be you know, with more certainty than we did before. 
Right. And I, I'm always cautious about this because it's it's interesting when, when I look at manufacturers. Historically, we don't make decisions based on people's recommendations. I mean, you can have all the data you, you want to show somebody, but until they prove it for themselves and they can see it, I think that's where AI plays a really incredible part too, is being able to show us now you can see where this is trending and where these are improving. Uh, things like predictive maintenance. I can now predict when these fluids are going to be breaking down. And I have a better idea based on that analysis so that it isn't just somebody else telling me, well, I need to change. Just let's take our cars, for example. You know, well, somebody says that I got to change the oil in my car every 3,000 miles or uh, synthetics. It's, you know, six plus thousand miles. Having some data to it really helps to reinforce that decision-making process is do you see an opportunity there for us to be better at what we do so that we can say hey this is going to be better for you but try it yourself and and see what your results are right right and, and you really hit it on the head because that's that's how it's been right and you know trust me uh, we're, we're better than a product you know a or b but um, you know that's that's really where we're at today because we are data driven and we're trying to utilize the data that we have in a in a more effective way, right? And so what we do, and and you said it perfectly, is you know we recommend a product and then we have to go out and we trial that product uh, with a customer and then we you know we may have to tweak it you know depending on the process. And, you know, you go through this in a few iterations, so you kind of dial it in, right? And so yeah. we're trying, you know, all of that, that process I just mentioned is time and it's money because it's a person's machine. It's the resources that you're, you know, you're taking and putting to this project. And there's a lot of it that goes into that. And so if we can predict, and we can uh, up front and provide the data first, uh, the last thing you want to do is provide somebody with a lubricant, tell them to try it, and they break the tool. You know, customers don't like that, right? Dye makers do not like that. Right. And so you've got to be sure that what you're providing is going to do the job. And, and how can we do that? And how can we do that better? And I think AI is going to be a, a more, you know, certainly consistent, predictable way to be able to provide them the data so that there's some assurance that I'm not going to screw up that hundred thousand dollars worth. And so right. we provide data today. We do it, you know, we do that upfront legwork. But I think where we're going to see is in the next three to five years, where that information is going to be so much more valuable than it is today. Mm -hmm. I could tell you when I started my career. I started back in late '80s, early '90s at Niagara Machina Tool Works. Uh, and when we started on presses, there was so much you had to do to try and fine tune, okay, what oil were you going to use? What was the viscosity? What was the, the thermal breakdown of that oil? What, how much oil? And what were the determining factors of how much oil you put on things like Gibbs and on a slide and, and uh, into your bearings and your bushings that you have on a machine. And one of the things that I believe from that standpoint, because it was trial and error at, at that time, I think we can make better decisions today because of where we are today. But I can see a point where that gets to an optimum point where it's you're going to run this material and you're going to run this type of clearances on your tooling. This is where you need to go. This is how much oil, this is how much you need to put on the material. This is how many, how much spray you have to use. And if you're aerating it and uh, I can see where that is going to take us in the future is what about things like uh, robotics in that, that type of area? Do you see more people getting into handling issues with lubricants and can lubricants play a a part in optimizing what's best because I, I know that some people have had issues with 
having a robot trying to pick a part up because they're using vacuum and and things like that. I think that goes, you know, that that goes back to you know understanding the application and how to apply that. You know, there's uh, we partner with we have some great partners with equipment that you know we provide data to, you know, so that when uh, they're you know when we're recommending or they're uh, incorporating uh, their equipment into a process. We really have a lot of that dialed in already. Um, but again, to your point, um, there's a lot of data relative to the type of steel. You know, what are they using uh, as far as uh, that goes and what type of press and what, you know, what's the uh, speed they're running that press at, you know? Or if you're looking at a, you know, even looking at a, um, uh, a CNC machine, I mean, again, type of material, you know, uh, is it a high pressure system? Is it not? I mean, there's just a, a lot of variables that go into, you know, determining that. And yes, I think AI and that predictability and understanding, you know, we ask a lot of questions up front before making a recommendation. I think having that, being able to process that data that we receive, and then that output is going to really be the determining factor on, on what they can do. And you're right, I think they can be really dialed into we're, we're doing this process, we're using this type of material, this is the type of lubrication we use, and we save a lot of time and effort of, of debugging and trialing and things like that. Our guest today has been Scott Prince from, from Tower Metalworking Fluids. I also like to close up things by asking the, the tough, another tough question of you, why? Why are you involved with DMA? Uh, well, there, there's a lot of reasons, right? But I, you know, for me personally, um, you know, the education, the information, and and the experience of, you know, networking with a lot of great people, uh, smart people, um, you know, really has gotten me to where I'm at today. And, and we talked about it earlier. I didn't know what a die maker was or what a press was when I started in this industry. Fortunately. Uh, the owner of my company, the president of my company, were very active with PMA back in the day. In fact, I think they were the the owner was one of the first uh, to to develop or incorporate the that one of the executive you know committees, and um, and they were very uh, you know very much about getting involved, learning, uh, joining committees. You know, I've I've been on many committees, board of directors. Um, I'm on an executive networking group today, and the people are just fantastic and sharing ideas. I don't care what business you're in, uh, Dean, they are, everyone is helpful. They want you to succeed, whether you're a competitor or not. It's amazing to watch how that really unfolds when you're at these events, you're talking, and it's really not, you know, being, you know, in an event, it, it's actually when you're out to dinner or you're in the hallway or someone you've met that, you know, you never thought could help. And it, it's just, uh, it's been amazing for me and I can't thank PMA enough for what it's done for my career. And, and personally, I mean, I've got some great friends that I met, you know, 20, 30 years ago that are, are dear friends of mine today. And, and uh, you know, it wouldn't have happened without PMA. So, if uh, you know, I would I would recommend that any uh, person, any company, or, or person wanting to get involved, it's it's get involved. You know, you can be a member and not be involved, and you're not going to really get out what you put them in. So, uh, PMA has just been uh, been great for me. Yeah, I I compare it to like a gym membership. You get out of it what you put into it. You can have a membership, but that it doesn't mean anything if you're not doing the work too of of wanting to get in there and wanting to connect. Because yeah. that's really the importance of of doing this. It is, and it's really important to tell. I mean, we have I got I have people involved with PMA. I encourage them to go to events, take you know, go to the webinars. So it's uh it's been fantastic, and uh, it's been great for Tower as well. Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsor, of course, uh, the Precision Metal Forming Association. I'd like to thank uh, our one voice for which is probably one of our lesser known uh, benefits for PMA is being involved with one voice, which is our group that goes and lobbies for the metalworking for manufacturing as a whole. And I think sometimes that's under 
underutilized and undercommunicated how important that is. And of course, Metal Warming Magazine, and we'd like to thank uh, Brad and his whole team over there and all their help. And Metal Form EDU has been immensely beneficial to the people that have used it. I, I could tell you the the new programs that we've had, we've come a long way from the VHS tapes. <laughs> I still, have, I still have those. <laughs> uh, I I had them until I moved. The last time I had the old uh, uh, videos from uh, from years and years ago. I I don't think the tape even held up from some of the moves. But uh, we really uh, want to thank everybody over there for all their hard work. And with that, I'd like to thank you, of course, Scott. Thank you for for being here today, and thank uh, of course Tower for allowing us this time to no, make I this happen it. yeah i appreciate uh, you having us and uh and yeah I, and just a quick shout out to to, to dave and, and jeff at yeah, I mean, they've been doing a great job and certainly all the past chairs for sure but uh it's been uh it's the last few years have been great yeah thank you and uh it's funny i for those listeners out there there is a whether you pronounce it GIF or JIF out there, of of Jeff Asimorian, where he's uh, dressed as a superhero, and it's an animation, and he's just does one of these. Uh, if you get a chance to see it, look it up on the PMA site. It is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I wish everybody a great day, and right. thank you again for uh, taking time out of your busy day to be here. Thanks, Dean. I appreciate it.